Dean. <laughs> Dean. So I'm a SEAL. Yeah. You're an SBS guy, Special Boat Service. service. Yeah. Because sometimes it gets messed up with like squadron. Because the squadron word is a very much an SAS thing. Is it also an SBS thing? It was an S it originally was a special boat squadron. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the SAS, as you touched on, is squadron. We have squadrons as well, but it's now known as the special boat service. So we have, you know, I mean, you have the SAS and the SBS. People have primarily heard of the SAS, and we're more the silent sister, as they say. It's 97% commonality between the units. And we actually do selection together. It's the same special forces selection. The only difference is, you know, SAS, surprisingly average soldier, SBS, slightly better soldier. Slightly better soldier. Slightly better. Slightly bigger as well. Slightly bigger. Yeah. <laughs> In all the right places, right? Exactly. Um, I find it interesting because, like, most people have not heard of the SBS. Everyone's heard of SEALs, and you can blame that on certain presidents or just global operations. But I think what most people don't know is that the SBS has been around like decades before SEALs were even invented, yeah. right? So you guys sure. have been around since when? So 1944, during the yeah. Second World War, the first famous uh, operation was uh, Operation Frankton, uh, when 10, 10 SBS operators in five kleppers paddled into the board. The clappers are your canoes. The clappers, yeah. yeah. Two-man yeah. canoe with canvas, wooden frame, low profile. That's, yeah, super yeah. cool. And they went in and just stuck limpet mines on the German uh, frigates in, in France. And actually that one operation shortened the war by six, six months, uh, but only two came back and they escaped and evaded over the Pyrenees and down to Gibraltar. So it's, that was the birth of the special boat service. Um, but yeah, as you touched on, we've been around for decades. And I, I know like the SAS, Again, the long range desert group, they all, all stem from the, the Second World War. Yeah. And we your SEAL teams, as, as I say, in the SBS, we have the four troops within the squadron. Do, do they have all the same sort of capabilities, mountain, boat, mobility, and air, or is it specific to a SEAL team? Well, unit? yeah, we started, we started regionally, right? So where I was at, SEAL Team 3, when I showed up, focused solely on Middle Eastern operations, desert operations. Yeah. SEAL Team 5 was more jungle and focused on regions that had jungles. Uh, so each of the teams had these different, you know, regional mission sets that they concentrated on. But when the wars kicked off, you realize, wait a minute, SEAL Team 3 can't just stay deployed for 12 years straight, right? <laughs> so they quickly realized, wait, we need to start rotating all SEAL teams around. So now we all rotate in coordination, we all train to all of the different subject matter expertise that we need based on current events and what's going on in the world. So our training will, you know, if hostage and terrorism and all those types of things are key words, then that block of training will then become go from a month to maybe three months, yeah. right? We'll just change the training based on what the mission sets are at that point in time. I'll take it, because um, for us, for the SBS, we have to, we're not just from the Navy, we're also from tri-service, the Air Force and the Army. So we have, certain skill sets when we come in so some of the guys like I, I i was a sergeant in the army i'd done eight years before i went in so i had skill sets anyway what we like to do is identify what skill sets you've got already so if you're a skydiver or a diver and then give you another another skill set well, you guys come straight in can come straight in for civilian street can't you into navy seals i mean i guess you yeah. just start filling in the gaps where where there's uh where there's slots is it well, the way it is, yeah, there's the way it was, and then there's the way it is. The way it was is when I came in, you had to go Navy boot camp, then to an A school. An A school just gives you a skill set and a rating so that, because the high probability of making it through BUDS, right, yeah. is you know, you're not going to make it. Mm. So they want you to have a job <laughs> whenever you either quit, get injured, or whatever. Right. They want you to have a job so they can, so that you can then be valuable to the big Navy. Now that all changed to where it's very competitive now. It's very difficult to get the buds, but it's also streamlined. But now you're competing with some of the world's, you know, best athletes. Mm -hmm. You're competing against, you know, Ivy League. You know, you're, there, it's so many people standing in line to go to buds now that there's a filter before you even come in the Navy, before you sign the dotted mm -hmm. line. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you don't have to do an A school anymore. You just go through boot camp, go to buds, and then if you make it, you're obviously off to the SEAL teams. If you don't, then I think there's a stipulation where they just say, get out of here. You're yeah. out of the Navy. And what do you think the attraction is to the Navy SEALs from, you know, coming from civilian? What is it that draws them to the Navy SEALs and maybe not some of the other units? Yeah, I think 
Hollywood, obviously books, all the things that, you know, did, didn't exist for me, mm. but I, I, I'd met a Navy SEAL when I was, you know, nine, 10 years old in, in Frankfurt airport. And so he sold me and it turns out that that guy was a complete fraud, told me a bunch of stories <laughs> that never happened. So, you know, I was like, oh, okay. But I didn't find that out till later, but I think in these days, yeah, it's, if you're a gamer, you might become a SEAL. If you love movies, well, then you might become a SEAL, right? If you like military books, then you probably will pick SEAL route. I think it's just, it has been very popular and people forget the army was very popular before us with Rambo, Rambo, Rambo 15, Rambo 16, <laughs> Rambo 17. Then you had Steven Seagal, right? He, then he was kind of Navy SEAL guy for a little while, yeah, right? Yeah. Former Navy SEAL martial arts guy in the movies. And uh, I love it when the army forgets about Chuck Norris and Sylvester Stallone, because it's like, well, you don't know, oh, you started all this. Yeah. We're just playing catch up. Uh, it's interesting because I always, when I, uh, when I uh, like to see what, what people's motivations are for joining the military, like for us, my motivation was my father was in the military and you tend to find that in the past. We didn't have, no, there was no social media. I'd never heard of the SBS or the Royal Marines before I joined the military. So obviously the current climate, yes, books, movies, but it's really interesting that actually Hollywood is probably only 25% of actually what we do. If you know, a lot of yeah, the stuff yeah. we do stuck in OPs or on surveillance is actually quite boring. So um, I'm always interested to see what people's motivations are. You know, I see guys, oh, I'm doing it because my dad or my brother is, and I was like, well, that's not really a motivation. Um, so, so that's really interesting to, to know. And obviously with the Americans, you guys, from the, coming from the UK, we have a population of 70 million. You know, within the SBS, we have 250. Uh, I think the SES is about 300 with a 95% failure rate. You know, what are the numbers, what are the numbers we expect from the SEALs? Yeah, I know that, you know, our failure rate in BUDS is the same. It's really high attrition rate. And then, um, and then the SEAL team numbers, they kind of keep that on the down low, but it's certainly bigger, mm -hmm. right, than you guys, because we have 300 million in yeah. the United States. And of course, you've got a bunch of motivated males that want to go and do cool stuff, fun stuff. and you know, probably, you know, a lot of it is patriotism. If you're gonna go the SEAL route, you're gonna go to special operations and you're probably really, you're red, white, and blue yeah. through and through, you know, to go down that path. Um, but our numbers are certainly in the thousands where yours are in the hundreds, but yeah. we're still the smallest, we're the, the smallest yet most capable force that concentrates solely on DA and recce, right? Mm -hmm. So our SF guys do not concentrate on the whole DA recce thing. Their primary mission is actually insurgencies and training other forces yeah. and, and allowing other countries to then either, whether it's an insurgency or rebellion, whatever it is that benefits the United States, it's mm -hmm. Green Berets that are gonna go in and train those forces and make them capable. Yeah. We're SEALs, all we do is small unit DA reconnaissance, Rangers, big unit DA reconnaissance. Okay. That's really it is, yeah. as far as the U.S. special operations, you know, kind of capability breakdown at a macro level. Yeah, I think obviously over the years, you know, especially these last few years, we've had Iraq, we've had Afghanistan and there's been so much other stuff around the world. And it seems to be now a slight lull. Um, I think that's affecting retention. I've mm. seen, I speak to a few guys and guys really struggling because they're bored. You know, they, they join because they see what they read in the books. Oh, yeah. They see what on the movie. But I think for me, I think you know, it's interesting about every 10 years there's a war and, it, and I, I don't know whether because there's, there's money in war, but also retention you need to keep the guys, keep the guys in, keep them, um, keep them entertained. Um, but for us, we really struggle because we, we are averaging about eight to 10 guys passing a course. We only have two courses a year, but during Afghan and Iraq, you know, guys were losing limbs, guys were getting killed, you know, guys were coming to retirement. We really struggled and we're, we're on a downward slope. But uh, so this period now is good to get get the numbers up again, but they're struggling to keep the guys in because they're bored. And, and there's some exciting stuff in Civvy Street as well, as, as we both know. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's the same for us guys that kind of missed that window, that mm -hmm. opportunity, even though it was a huge window, obviously a lot of people had a lot of fun, a lot of trigger time, mm -hmm. a lot of great real world operations. Like Admiral Olson said it best, you know, from his time early on, it was like the operation of the year, right? You'd be lucky if you got one badass yeah. op in a year as being a SEAL. Yeah. And he was like basically saying, hey, what used to be the operation of the year is now the operation of the night. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because now guys, you're rolling sometimes two, three, you know, during that window is two, three missions a day. Mm -hmm. 
And now we've come to a screeching halt and guys that are used to that are leaving and the guys that came in for it are going, what happened? Yeah. Why aren't we getting to play anymore? Yeah, true, know? yeah. Well, we had it with our peers, as you talk, I love that phrase, operation of the year. Our peers would be in for like 10 years and not get any action. I mean, in a short period of time, you know, these young young bucks were coming through the door and we're like doing the first ever operational jumps with rescuing hostages and in a, such a short period of time. And then it, all of a sudden it's just dropped off. But these young lads now are hearing our stories. But I always say, be careful what you wish for. You know, there's a lot of guys, oh, I wish I was on the operation. I always say, be careful what you wish for. It will come around, you know, you'll get your time and you'll get your action. Yeah, yeah, I totally get it. I mean, for us, war, unlike almost any other occupation on the planet, war, is the pinnacle of a career in the military. Yeah. Like you're like, yeah, war. <laughs> Everyone else is like, are you crazy? But the reality is, is war is what we're all training for. We want to go do it. And we want to fulfill that one thing. Mm. And uh, I, so I feel for the guys that don't get that opportunity because they're sitting there for 20 years and not getting to pull the trigger in anger. And that kind of sucks. I think they still need to know that they are important because anytime, as we see, the, the, the yeah. world is, so unstable at the moment you know it's really changed i've seen the way we've gone from the cold war into a whole technical war in afghanistan and actually now seeing the way that's training we're going back to the old cold war so when we were in afghanistan and iraq we really lost you know the sas special air service were better at um you're not better but, well they weren't better but they had more <laughs> they, weren't they just had I'm more just ex, they had more experience in in maritime and water yeah. and the sps and we had more experience in air and mobility than them and actually yeah. you know that was their skill sets not like ours so we've really gone back to our core va our values of insurgent skills you know the old days of being able to get behind enemy lines because everything now is biometric and passports so it's, yeah, it's yeah. amazing to see how we've we've done a full loop in, in the yeah. last few years back to the basics yeah, I think it's funny how you say it's like the SBS doing more jumps than the yeah. SAS. And when you look at big, the big military, it's like the Navy ha actually has more aircraft than the Air Force. <laughs> And then the Coast Guard actually has more boats than the Navy. So it's like, yeah. you know, it's, it's actually kind of funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I always remember, you know, I joined the military at 17 and I sort of look back at the person I was there to the person I am now. And I'm very thankful of my time in the military and I learned so much. Yes, I got those skill sets, but those sort of personal things, you know, being able to speak confidently in front of other people, um, being tested, and in harsh situations and being able to make decisions you know i've really sort of if i look back at the person i was there to the person now you know if, if you put me into a, a scenario i'd be running around like a you know chicken with a head off or like an officer with a map you know what i mean but um but now i sort of those experiences i gained from the military have put me in good stead for now being a civilian uh, i don't know if you feel the same as any skill sets you you think have really really helped you on your transition when you came out? Yeah, I think uh, I think you nailed it. It's you you gain all these skills. You don't know it at the time. That's the beauty of the military, right? Yeah, yeah. All that discipline and then checking checking off all these tasks in order to make the next rank and then, you know, and then doing all these other kind of task oriented checklists in order to pull off a mission or go do something. And then involved in that is like, oh, I got a brief, a senator mm -hmm. or maybe a congressman or maybe just my admiral. So and then when you add it all up and you do, for me, 20 years of doing that, and then you get out and you realize, wow, there's a lot of business acuity that I had built up that now makes it real easy. I learned how to start articulating myself and learned how important that was early on in the military because you can't stand up in front of any of our leadership and go, I, 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 I don't know, what I, you, you, I'm not really good at this, yeah. right? That's not gonna work. Yeah, sure. So this, the military gives you all these skills and what, what blows my mind is the guys that don't realize it yeah. right? and they transition out and they don't really know how to take all that and then work it for their advantage work it to their advantage in the civilian sector right mm. and i think that's uh that's the differentiator once you realize like oh i gained all that stuff that has nothing to do with combat it has no. nothing to do with jumping out of planes diving blowing shit up it's the other stuff. It's the peripheral things you were doing every day yeah. that actually you get out and you're like, oh, whoa, this all works for me. This all works actually for the people I'm talking to and I'm actually better at it yeah. than people that have MBAs, right? Yeah. Like getting up and talking, right? Well, I've had a few friends who, I think a lot of people are really cautious about getting out. You know, they're almost in their comfort zone and they're really worried. And, and you see a lot where it's an identity crisis. You've gone from working in a tiny unit in a team with everyone 
like-minded individuals um, with real passion to be the best that they can be to like, how am I now going to fit in society? I don't have a degree. I don't have a bachelor's. You know, how am I going to compare myself to others? But you have, as you touched on this, skill sets there you, you just don't realise you had. You know, be able to do execution and planning, working as a team. And when the plan doesn't work, you know yeah. what I mean? Being reactive to that. And I, I know in the corporate sector, a lot of people really struggle with that. And the corporate sector, from my time as well, doing a lot of uh, guest speaking and, and summits, is they're trying to get their leadership to you know, replicate what we do in the military. You cannot replicate those experiences we had in the military, however big your, your company is. And so, you know, I, I believe that you can't be experienced without experiences. So everything that we've done, whether it was right, whether it was wrong, whether we passed, whether we failed, we just sort of learned from that. And then one thing that you really touched on, I think is how, is how we articulate as well. I know some guys and girls really struggle when they get out. They don't know how to talk. To civilians, they yeah. think they're, they're sergeant majors talking to their recruits. It's like, no, you know, you need to, that is your past and something you should be proud of. But when you come out, you need to sort of, it's the way that you present yourself. And uh, some people really struggle with that as well. Yeah, I agree. And I think the advantage ultimately that we have is we can take on and welcome constructive criticism, right? We have thick skin in the military, especially, especially in special operations, right? We're making fun of each other all the time, but we're also really good at doing, you know, the hot wash, right? Yeah. Pull all the rank off, pull all the experience off, get into a room and really identify what went wrong, what went right, and everybody walks out of the room much better for it. Yeah. And not getting hung up on, well, I'm the highest ranking guy, so what I say goes. Yeah. In our community, that doesn't matter. It's sure. like, no, it's a collective effort. It's a round table. And I think having that kind of mentality and bringing it into the civilian sector, which is kind of unheard of, because yeah. you've got management, you have leaders, you have all this stuff in the corporate world, and they get hung up on their titles, mm -hmm. not thinking about the bigger objective, which is win. You just want to win, whether it's yeah. make money or kill the bad guys. Winning is the objective and rank and experience really kind of goes out the window when it's time to actually, you know, get to it. Yeah, that's a key one is objective. You need to have an objective and, and that's what's in the, in the military. But I sort of look in the mirror each day and I saw as long as I stay with the same, we have a special forces ethos in the UK, as long as I stay to the, those ethos and core values in, in the corporate sector, it works. And ours is, you know, integrity. Uh, humility, as you've touched on there. Humor, you need a sense of humor. I, I sometimes don't think people get our humor. You know, mm -hmm. it's a bit dark. You know, uh, there's courage, but also the unrelenting pursuit of excellence. You know, you do every, everything to the best of your ability. Um, and it, and to me, I think a lot of people when they get out of the military think they're below their counterparts. So actually they're in, their starting position's a lot higher and they just need to sort of know that, know that when they get out. Let's dig into, um readiness you know yeah. it's popular these days uh, every there isn't a there isn't a swipe on any of the social media platforms without some kind of edc everyday carry or you know some kind of hey i have a tourniquet i have my knife i have a gun but really readiness isn't about all it's not all solely into the gear mm -hmm. as much as it is mindset yeah. and so where's your mindset as it relates to like readiness yeah obviously from the military i've seen periods where we've gone from within an hour, you know, being very calm to all of a sudden changes, you know, you're flying to the other side of the world, you, you have to go rescue hostages or you have to deal with some of the bad guys. So I know how quickly things can change from being stable to unstable. And so for me, I, I always like to be ready. I don't like to be the person that, that they're waiting on. Um, but as you touched on, yeah, I see people buying all the gear and it's like, well, you've got all the gear, but do you know what you're doing? You know, we, we have a phrase, all the gear, no idea. You know what I mean? So it's good having the gear, but also to have a plan. You know what I mean? So for me, I always like to have uh, a plan, know what I'm doing, have the right equipment. And so if, if called upon or if needed at any time, I can just, just grab that bag. You know, I work, still work around the world dealing with crisis management. And mm -hmm. any time my phone will go off, I need to know that I'm ready to deploy and help those people. I agree. It's the same for me. Uh, mine goes back pre-military, like the whole readiness game started from Boy Scouts when Boy Scouts was actually cool, right? <laughs> I grew up in Saudi. I was in a country where we had you know, any aircraft guns outside of our American compounds just because Libya was always a threat back then, right? Um, and I grew up with this like secure environment, you know, we had a commissary, we had an exchange, but we weren't in the military, we were working for an oil company. And that, that readiness piece was always there. And on a side note, 
my dad had his own distillery, right? Making wine in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and so there was this level of readiness inside our house. Like if the religious police come, Clint, you go to the toilets, you open the tops and you dump them in. That's your job, okay? So if we hear that, you're just dumping wine as fast as you can, right? <laughs> so that little bit of like, paranoia almost, mm. right? Readiness can be paranoia in its own way, depending on how, how much you take it on. And it can be like this mental game, but I think having it as a kid like that and then traveling the globe in the eighties when terrorism was once again, this big issue and hijackings were a big issue. Uh, I remember landing in Greece and once again, there's tanks out on the runway and you're like, what the f are these things for, yeah. right? So for me as a kid, it just started early and then get into the military, that's when I knew I was home because I was like, oh yeah, everyone's kind of like this, right? Yeah. And, it, and it's expected of you to be always ready, like always have a plan, always know what you're doing and always get ahead of whatever that potential threat is. And so by being ready all the time, whether it's the gear, your checklists and how you view the things going on in front of you as it relates to situational awareness or third party awareness or personal awareness, like how I'm dressed, and then the big one, you know, that, that third party piece where anybody can scrutinize you, judge you, and you haven't even shaked their hand, you've never met them before in your life, yeah. right? And uh, for me, it all just adds up into this, yeah, always be ready. All right, I got one for you. So we both agree that the SEAL teams really are the more experienced guys up to date, right? Within the US military? No, globally. We're like, you, you have to, I mean, we're in the news all the time. You guys aren't in the news. It's because you can't find us. Oh, that's true. We fly under the radar. So you know? guys are probably yeah, no. more secretive? Uh, maybe. We're just not good at writing and making writing books. I mean, how many countries are you guys really operating? I mean, we're operating all of them. Where, where, where are you? I don't ever see, I never see you guys there. Well, you have to look at the history. You know, the U UK used to own 75% of the world and we're, we're always, oh, we're always picking go, up our yeah. mess. You know what I mean? And forgiving. <laughs> The UK, our, all, the UK always Forgiving our great-grandfathers, you know, there's a reason we don't have um, Thanksgiving, you know, because if we had a holiday for every country we handed back, we'd never work. Well, that's true, but yeah. if there wasn't the, uh, what was it, the, the, why is it America stood up again? Was that treason day, was it? <laughs> Something like that, I don't know. A bunch of Brits running away from a monarchy <laughs> that was, uh, it was, it was, it was like religious prosecution. They wanted religious freedom. They came yeah, to America. I just blame the French. That's why we still don't like the French. You know what I mean? <laughs> the French do steal a lot of secrets. Oh, right. I mean, and then they sell it to the world. So you never trust the French or the Swiss. You know, no one that aligns himself with anyone can never be trusted, right? They never pick a line, right? They never pick a side. So, you know, they always stay neutral. And anybody that's neutral, you can't trust, right? Oh, anyone who doesn't drink as well. I've heard that, yeah. yeah. Or that wear underwear. Do you wear underwear? No, I've not worn underwear since I did my commando course at 17. So I've been There's a commando ever since. Yes. There we go, yeah. And did you guys, I think you guys probably invented the whole like no underwear thing. Seals don't wear underwear. Yeah, only in the jungle wear uh, cycling shorts. That's the only time I'll ever wear underwear. Yeah, I think that's probably, I don't even know if I did that. But well, for me, it was, just, it was less, 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 uh, less doby to wash, you know, less laundry. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Minimize it. Okay. So the SEAL teams are better. We got that figured out. <laughs> uh, SBS. Yeah. They've been playing in the, in the, playing around the globe for decades prior to the SEAL teams even being invented. So I'll give you that. You guys have the history. Yeah. And we actually, I mean, personally, I always looked up to SAS SBS guys mm -hmm. early on. In fact, I used to have these little, these, you know, the GI Joe guys, but they were these SAS guys. Did you oh, ever really? have those? No, I never had it. Like I say, What's I- What's that I, big fancy toy store in London? Action, oh, Hamleys. So I'm, here I am a kid going there and they had these, they're a little bigger than GI Joe guys. Oh really? And then you got this little thing in the back of their head that made their eyes look both ways. Yeah. You ever play with those things? No, I never They had a Draeger. They yeah. had the guns, but it was all H&K products because oh, you wow. guys lo loved H&K. Yeah, you we still H&K guys? Uh, we have HK MP5s for the more the, the counterterrorism stuff. Um, yeah, so we use, no, I never had those dolls. They're like, you know, they, they, get, they get joints and yeah. they do more than a Barbie. I like to do strategy. I set up a whole battlefield. I was like trying to get ahead yeah. on being tactical. I mean, what'd you do to get ahead? You play football that got you ahead on tactical? Well, I had to. My, my father was the uh, was the army soccer manager and coach. So uh, his father. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't selling illegal wine in Saudi. He was playing well, football. No, we weren't selling it. We're just making it. My dad had to get through. Do you ever live grown in, a, in an extreme religious state? Okay, uh, you know our parents had to drink in order to get through it each year. No, but I think you touched on it earlier though. Like our special forces have been around a long, long time. I think there was a colonel who came and spent two years with the SAS. I mean, came and set up. Yeah. Delta Force in 77. Yeah. So 
But I think the, the great thing about the units is that, um, that cross training now, uh, the fact that, especially post 9-11, you know, the first phone call that Bush got was from Tony Blair, our prime minister saying, where do you want us? And I think from that day on, you know, I've, I've been noticed pretty. it's been pretty tight. And, you know, you guys, we, we, we look up to you guys and you know that if we, we got your backs, you know, you know that we've had the testing and we, we've got the skill sets and, and vice versa. Yeah, I agree. I had a, gr a lot of great joint operations with your SRR guys, yeah. SBS dudes um, here. In, it was spread out over my entire career, depending on where I was at and what I was doing. But, you know, it was always it was always a lot of fun because we got the same sick twisted dark mentality that every good operator should have it's that ethos of humor you know you yeah. need a sense of humor but yeah. i think that's I, I think that's credit to your buds to our selection is that you know you know at the end you've got a product who can work with any other unit but it has the right mindset doesn't take things too seriously mm -hmm. you know what i mean um can look internally and, and have a laugh um so yeah that no, was good but again i think we're just slightly bigger and slightly better that's the only difference <laughs> <laughs> you do have cool accents here in America. Oh yeah. Now, so the Texas thing. Do, do you think I could do pretty? Good? What if I moved to the UK? You think I? Oh, you clean right? up. Yeah. You clean up. Yeah. yeah. Like here, I, I talk with a silver spoon in my mouth, and I really sort of ex exaggerate my English accent. Yeah. You, know, you should. I, normally, I sound like someone on Guy Ritchie movie. You won't be able to understand anything I'm saying because it's all Cockney slang. Well, every now and then, I have to go. What the f did you just say? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs>